Hydration isn't only for athletes training, it's for all of us. It's a huge part of daily maintenance. Whether you were in New Orleans, Japan, or honestly anywhere in the world this summer, there was no escaping the crazy heat wave we had. When I was in Japan back in July, I spent plenty of time outdoors, walking from place to place, just a hot, sweaty mess. While those convenience stores along the way had some refreshing drinks like Picari Sweat, there was one thing I wish I had brought along with me for the trip. Liquid IV, the number one powdered hydration brand in America. I found out about Liquid IV after getting back, and I'll say the convenient packaging alone makes this a must-bring wherever you're going, be it any type of travel, business, or pleasure. After a workout, sometime outside in the heat, or maybe just after a long night with friends. With only one stick and 16 ounces of water, Liquid IV hydrates you two times faster and more efficiently than water alone, while taking in five essential vitamins, that's B3, B5, B6, B12, and C, and three times the electrolytes as leading sports drinks. It comes in 12 tasty flavors. My favorite, personally, is strawberry lemonade and tropical punch. Real people, real flavor, real hydrating. Get 20% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use Crew of Japan, K-R-E-W-E-O-F-J-A-P-A-N, at checkout. That's 20% off anything you order when shopping Better Hydration today using promo code Crew of Japan at liquidiv.com. What are you waiting for? Get hydrated. Hello, I'm Doug, and welcome to the Crew of Japan podcast, a weekly podcast where we take you on audio journeys through Japanese culture. This time on Crew of Japan podcast. Welcome back to another episode of our favorite show entitled, What? More bonus content when Doug should be editing season five stuff? That's my favorite. Actually, we are still hard at work getting ready for season five. No lies told there. Last week, we sat down with Godzilla expert, Dr. William Tsutsui, to discuss the history and evolution of everyone's favorite King of the Monsters. That will be releasing in early Season 5, which is still hopefully scheduled to launch towards the end of January or beginning of February. But while I had Bill on the line, I asked him if he'd be interested in doing a discussion on Toho's latest Godzilla hit, Godzilla Minus One, and he happily obliged. So here is that chat in its full entirety, but be warned it is full of spoilers. So if you're looking for a spoiler-free discussion, this is probably not the listen for you right now. But do make sure you come back and check this out after you see the movie. So again, if you do not want to hear Godzilla Minus One spoilers, you may want to hit the bookmark button on your browser or save this podcast episode for a later date. But for those of you sticking around, let's get to it. Here's what's going on with Japan Society in New Orleans. Be sure to check the show notes for more links and details. Here we go. On Monday, December 18th at 6.30 p.m., Japan Society of New Orleans is hosting a Zoom session led by our awesome guest from Season 4 and founder of Ikigai Connections, Kasha Lynch, to discuss ways to jumpstart your Japan-related career. She'll share info about Japan-related career development tips, tricks, and ideas on how to discover your Japan dream job, as well as an open forum question and answer session. No cost to participate, and it's open to the public, but Zoom registration is required. Check the event page on Japan Society's website and or social media for sign up and more details. It'll all be linked out in the show notes as well. See you there. So we have a bonus episode that we are releasing ahead of the actual interview that took place minutes ago. That episode is not coming out until probably a couple months from now. I don't actually know the exact date. But I have with me today, Bill Tsutsui, resident Godzilla expert, author of Godzilla On My Mind. Hey, Bill, how are you doing? I'm wonderful, thank you. We just finished recording an interview talking about the entirety of Godzilla. Fandom, history, what led to Godzilla, where it's going from here, and everything in the middle. But I would be remiss not to give a little bit more time, especially at the time of recording. It's early December, right after Godzilla Minus One release. I'd be remiss not to stick on Godzilla Minus One for a little bit. So I asked Bill if you'd be interested in sticking around and helping create a bonus episode talking about that film and talking about the tremendous success that it's been. So first of all, how many times have you seen Godzilla Minus One? And today is December 8th. So it's only been out for how long in the US? Maybe a, a week and a half? Just over a week. That's right. Yep. So I have seen it twice now. Twice. But I'll tell you, the first one I saw, I managed to get a ticket to the uh, premiere in Los Angeles oh, uh, wow. about a month ago. So I got to see it before most fans did. And that was one of the great experiences of my life. 
to see the red carpet. And actually, I was just down the row from the director oh, of wow. the film at the screening at Director's Guild of America. So that was super cool. Were any of the cast from the movie, were they there? The star too, was or? there, the male lead uh, okay. was there. I was not allowed to get that close to them. <laughs> sure, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> but it was truly a privilege for me. Oh, uh, I haven't bet. loved Godzilla for more than half a century to be at the premiere of such a fun movie. You're going to have to work your way into Godzilla and King Kong. You gotta... There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But so you've seen it twice. I've only seen it once. I It's fresh in my mind, though. I saw it Wednesday afternoon with my son. And also fresh in my mind is Gojira, the original, the, the original Japanese movie of Godzilla. You know, so I, I made sure to watch it after that just to kind of give myself a mental comparison between the two. So first and foremost, I wanted to get your general thoughts on the movie itself. Obviously, it's a huge success that the fact that it got extended out multiple weeks speaks volumes. I honestly think this is a great movie and it's got something for everyone, which I think is pretty remarkable. So it's got this great special effects scenes. It's got Godzilla destroying Tokyo, which people want to see. But it also, unlike many recent Godzilla movies, it has a great human drama mm -hmm. at the core of it. Uh, it very much is focused on people as well as the big monster. And I have to say, it's got plenty of fan service for people like myself. Oh, Lots yeah. of references to the Godzilla series over time. So you can just go through this movie, uh, like you said, uh, and look for all the parallels with the 1954 film, but also the other films as well. And for a movie that's pretty long, it's a little over two hours, boy, that movie goes by quickly. It does. It does. And again, this is going to have spoilers. So if you were looking for a spoiler free discussion, this is not for you. This is <laughs> going to be spoiler heavy. But yeah, I, I agree. Like it flew by. It yeah. flew by. Like I was surprised. Like I looked at my watch. I'm like, how is it already an hour and a half into this movie? Because it, it just it flew by so quickly. And you know, so often when you watch Godzilla movies, the more humans talking there are, the more boring it yeah. is. You know? And in this movie, which does not have any scenes with generals meeting with politicians deciding how to destroy Godzilla, right. I think that's one of the things that really carries it forward. It takes an entirely different approach from any film, except perhaps the original Godzilla in 1954, where it really looks at how the monster's attacks affect common people. Yeah. It's not about the elites. It's not about government. It's about, from a human perspective, what does that monster mean? And you see it in the way the movie is made, too. I don't know if you noticed, but most of the shots of Godzilla are from a human's eye view of yeah. the monster. So you're looking up at the monster. So many of the other films, Godzilla's gotten so big now in so many of the movies. It's like you're watching him from a helicopter flying nearby or from the top of a skyscraper. In this one, it feels like Godzilla's about to step on you sometimes and you're yeah. running away in fear. They, they really, especially when they're doing the Tokyo scene, you don't ever actually see. I mean, you do see full body Godzilla at some points, obviously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you are just seeing like his foot or his hand, you know, like yeah. pieces uh -huh. of him. It just, again, from the human perspective, it was yeah. just cinematography was yeah. out, of, mm -hmm. out of the world. Yeah. And I thought it was really interesting how they gave Godzilla lore and said, oh, this is just a monster from an island. You know, in the beginning of the movie, they lead out, you, you jump right into Godzilla, but it's not the Godzilla that you know, because like, obviously the Godzilla you see in Tokyo way later is huge compared yeah. to the one you see. The one you see in, in the beginning of the movie is kind of like a T-Rex in Jurassic Park, you know, that yeah. size. Mm -hmm. So it gives it a little bit more like, hey, this is what Godzilla really was. And then look what you did, America, <laughs> when you when you did your your testing, your nuclear testing in the Pacific. Look what you did. And they show them kind of like transforming, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, you know, I think, you know, one of the things that I think is brilliant about this movie is the way it keeps the, you know, the origins of the monster essentially the same mm -hmm. as they were in the 1954 original, right? This is a dinosaur that has somehow survived for millions of years, and that then is mutated by American H-bomb testing and attacks Tokyo, but they put it in an entire, entirely different framework yeah. in Godzilla minus one. The way that the monster is ultimately destroyed is completely different oh, from yeah. the 1954 original. And that's very clever, I think. When I first saw the trailers for this film, I thought, this is going to be some kind of weird prequel. And it really isn't. It is rethinking those origins, that Genesis story of the monster in very fundamental ways. It very much was like a reboot instead of a prequel. I thought, yeah, again, I thought right. it was going to be, yeah. when they said minus one, I thought it was just like, 
how are they going to make it happen? But then people don't remember it happening. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, how is this going to work? So I really didn't know going into the movie. I tried to stay away from a lot of the, you know, the information that was kind of out there, yeah. uh, especially since it had been released in Japan already for about a month before yeah. before mm-hmm. I got to see it. So I was trying to stay away and stay spoiler free. But yeah, no, I, I thought it was so good and so good. And, and I think part of it, like you mentioned, there's a huge human element to it. But the themes, the theme of the movie, just perseverance. And just pushing through, like getting past those humps in your life and looking forward and not back. And, you know, things like that, they showed that in so many different ways. You know, there are those wonderful moments where there are a couple of times in the film where a character says, we've got to do this as horrible as it is because there's no one else who's going to. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's a wonderful Japanese kind of sentiment Mm -hmm. that we're going to take this for the good of everybody, even if it means maybe we're going to die uh, in the process. Yeah. Somebody has got to do it. And, you know, that's one of the real film uh, themes of the movie, I think. The other, I think, is about redemption after the war. In many ways, this is about a war that was not over because there were still such deep feelings of shame uh, on the part of the Japanese people, a feeling of guilt because they were survivors of the war, mm-hmm. whereas mm-hmm. so many people had died. And this film really shows the ways that people could have worked through this psychologically using Godzilla. Yeah. That embodiment of the shame and the guilt is the main character. I mean, he's a a kamikaze pilot that, for lack of a better term, abandons his post, fakes a a malfunction on his plane to get out of following through with what his role was supposed to be. Yeah. Um, And him living with that shame, even though he had, he wanted to live, but he was shamed for wanting to live because his role was that he should have died. Yeah. And that kind of continues through the entire movie. And it's almost ironic because like in the end, he chooses life. You know, he chooses, he has the opportunity to redeem that and he doesn't. He's given an opportunity to either go through with what he was supposed to in the beginning or move past it. Like you said, redeem himself and and move forward with his life and continue and fight on. Yeah. And he did. And he he chose that. And he had other things that steered him towards that. So yeah. And that's sort of the lesson for Japan, right? You know, after the war, uh, that the Japanese have to find a way to move on. And I think it's a lesson for our world today. You know, one of the things about the movie that I think some people have said it doesn't have a lot of relevance for the world we live in today. And I think they're wrong because, you know, one of the core themes in the movie is, you know, the government barely appears in the movie. Yeah. Either the Japanese government or the occupation that's running the country at the time uh, it is set, you know? And that's because, as the characters all say, the government is useless, you know? We can't trust the government to get things done. Who's going to get things done? Well, it is just everyday citizens coming together to try and find solutions, you know? Yeah. And I think that's the age in which we live. We're pretty cynical uh, about finding our solutions in either Washington or Tokyo. And the answer might be, boy, we should get together as a group. Uh, We should uh, figure out a plan and we should just do it. Somebody's got to do it. Let's do it. You know, and we talked about this in the the bigger interview that's going to be coming out later. The historical context of the original Godzilla was taking place about uh, roughly what seven or eight years after the the war yeah. ended mm-hmm. and the u.s presence still even in that was mentioned multiple times yes. and, and uh-huh. but you yeah. had mentioned like the historical context of like the cold war and russia and and u.s tensions and that was actually heavily discussed i feel like in in godzilla minus one they mentioned it multiple times like that's why the u.s can't deal with this because yeah. they are so preoccupied with they can't be you know <laughs> so yeah. uh, maybe they didn't want to uh, try to cover all that in the same movie and they want to focus on the humans going through it on the ground so that was their out i guess but uh, it worked it worked in my opinion it did work i think you know i actually didn't miss seeing you know the government or general macarthur very much in this movie because the focus really was on these people and their lives and how it was intertwined uh with godzilla yeah for sure so we're going to kind of loop back to the original movie now again there were a lot of parallels Obviously, we talked about the origin and they did deviate, not only deviate, but they gave in the original movie, I feel like they just mentioned, oh, it's it's this Godzilla, the mythical creature on this island. But they actually show Godzilla as that mythical creature pre-mutation. 
right. show what people were dealing with because the people, the the pilots and the mechanics on the island knew yep. of this creature. They knew of it. They were terrified of it. They had a, a, a knowledge of it. Whereas in the original, I feel like they kind of just, the old people were talking about like, oh, don't talk about that again. <laughs> like, oh, you know, like you crazy old man, you know, like, that's a, kind of the it's feel I right. got. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And so this actually gave it some, it put fear in your heart for the characters. Like yeah. they experienced it. Yeah. And, you know, I just thought it was wonderful. All the nods to the original movie through uh, Godzilla minus one, you know, first of all, as you mentioned with Odo Island, you right, know, right, being right. The, uh, a site, which is a fictional place, uh, the site where Godzilla first appears in both of the films. And then the music, you know, they used a lot of the music. I, I noticed from that, yeah. The 1954 movie, and that is just so memorable and wonderful. And it works so well in Godzilla minus one. But, you know, there's a famous scene uh, in the 1954 movie where after Godzilla's first raid on Tokyo, uh, there's a young girl standing by her dying mother and she screams, you know, until a nurse comes and hugs her. You know, we have that in Godzilla Minus One uh, with uh, the adopted child, you know, screaming uh, when her mother is gone. Uh, We have the guys in rubber lab coats with Geiger counters, you know, out measuring uh, the radioactivity uh, of the monster. And, you know, one of my favorite scenes in the original is at one point when Godzilla is rampaging through the Ginza, he swings his tail and he accidentally hits a big round building. Mm -hmm. And that big round building, right, is the Nichigeki Theater in Ginza. And that is the flagship movie theater of Toho Studios, the studios that makes the Godzilla movie. And so in the original film, that was a joke, right? Right. You know, like how the Simpsons make fun of Fox all the time. This was sort of the producers of the film, you know, having Godzilla just sort of swat at the uh, movie theater for Toho. Well, you know, in uh, Godzilla Minus One, you'll see, he really goes to town destroying the Nichigeki Theater. (laughs) (laughs) That's really cool. (laughs) I thought it was pretty funny. Not funny, because they all died. Uh, But the the, the people that were the reporters and stuff, they tried to recreate that scene where they're they're like uh broadcasting it. And and the entire time I watched, I'm like, why are you there? What are you thinking? (laughs) (laughs) You see? (laughs) You gotta but, run, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But they try to re- they they did they really try to recreate some of those iconic scenes and then add that element that storyline the main overarching storyline mm-hmm. they plugged into it you know like in the main characters are going through Godzilla's rampage as opposed to I feel like in the original they were going through it but they're just more of observers they weren't really yeah, physically right. involved whereas yeah. mm-hmm. you know was it a Nordico I think was his Nordico. Yeah, yeah she was in Ginza on the train when Godzilla came through. Yeah. And, you know, she happened to be like running away from him while he was stomping on people and coming down the street and inevitably saves the main protagonist. Yeah. Was it Koichi, I think? Is his name Koichi? Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So they were in it. Whereas in the original, there's more of like, you're just kind of watching from the sidelines and seeing the destruction happening. Yeah. There are so many elements in here that you can talk about. It's a really rich picture. It is. Uh, and it really is a testament to its director, uh, Yamazaki Takashi. If people haven't seen Yamazaki's other movies, I encourage them to watch them because there are so many themes that carry through from his other major productions. He's probably most famous for the trilogy Always, you know, which is translated to something like Dusk on Third Street or something uh, <laughs> like that. But there are these nostalgic films of Japan in the 1950s and mm-hmm. 1960s, very much human dramas. And when those people in Godzilla Minus One are living in the ruins of Tokyo and slowly rebuilding their lives and the house and the family, you know, you really get a sense of the always films. Okay. Uh, and then uh, Yamazaki did a film called The Eternal Zero, which, mm-hmm. you know, is a story of a kamikaze pilot who can't go through with his mission, uh, wow, yeah. but then ultimately overcomes his fears and does so. And a, a very interesting movie called, what is it called? The Great War of Archimedes, something like that. It's, it's not a very good title, but it's about the building of the battleship Yamato okay. and a discovery of government corruption in that process. So it's another movie about mistrusting the government and about people trying to crusade and come to better solutions by themselves. So, and that's kind of what happened with this movie. They're like they kind of get everyone in a room, people who want to be there. They called, they called all the former, was it former naval officers and uh-huh. naval yeah. Navy uh-huh. folks. And, you know, they came and they said, look, we're not making you stay here. It's up to you. 
like it's your choice and then you know obviously some people left some stayed but i I felt like that was really like putting the power in the people and it's like hey if you want to live we got to do this we got to go through this it's a very humanistic film both from the sense that it focuses on human beings and their emotions and so forth but also that the value on life is so high here yeah. You know, what's funny is when you get to the end of the movie, and you know, we know there are going to be spoilers uh, in here, and the monster ends up being killed. You feel, though, at the end that the victory for all those naval guys who have been fighting Godzilla is only about half we've defeated Godzilla. The other half is Shikishima, the pilot, survives, right? right? He right. bails out of the plane because there's that wonderful silence. You know, the movie's really loud. And then all of a sudden, there's what seems like an hour of silence when everyone is like watching, you know, Godzilla's head about to explode and the plane flying in. And then, you know, the pilot bails out and survives. It shows the values of the people that saving him becomes a heroic thing. Right, right. His story arc, it was crazy because he had some peaks and valleys along the way and really dark dark moments like ptsd and just how Mm -hmm. to cope and letting people in and things like that yeah and you kind of see that too with uh tachibana the other the mechanic the lead mechanic where he in the beginning was very hateful towards him and still even even when they reunited like not very great terms but (laughs) he even moved past and i think the pilot koichi shikishima he saw that tachibana was able to move past it yes and by Uh seeing that allowed him to it made his decision easier because he was ready to walk away from his adopted daughter yeah and Mm -hmm. and and do the sacrificial like i'm doing this for the world yeah but then he saw that there was an out and that the guy who's giving him the out is the guy who hated him for not doing his job originally yeah and you know yeah, it was it was just such a great storyline, just of redemption for all the characters, really. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, you know, what, what's interesting, of course, is the way it ends. Of course, we know there are going to be sequels. So Godzilla's yeah, yeah. not dead. <laughs> you, know? you see, I don't know what it was that was beating. Was it his heart that was regrowing from his heart or his it head? It was or sort of gross something. and cool, and I liked it. <laughs> it's like a chunk of flesh. It's just like all of a sudden just mutating and growing out like a yeah <laughs> but then the other thing of course is as they focus in on the hug with noriko at the end there's some weird black stain on yeah. her neck and it's like what's with that yeah. is that a Where radiation thing or what you know right. and, and so you got to feel that there's sort of a dark cloud even in that moment of you know redemption and victory yeah yeah and i wonder if that if they if and whenever they do come out with the sequel if that's going to be something that they answer more questions about, or if it's just like, oh no, we're just, that was just more of a like, Godzilla may be gone, but he's still with us. You know, yeah. that's a, you know, a lasting mark, literally and figuratively. Yeah. That's what the fans love, because one of the great things about 2016's Shin Godzilla is the way it ends with Godzilla sort of frozen there in yeah. front of Tokyo Station with all these creepy, like fossilized things coming out of his scales. What yeah. are those? What does that mean? We'll never know. But the beauty of it is we can argue about it forever as oh, fans. Oh, for sure, for sure. So are they, I wonder if they're going to, are they going to tie this movie to Shin Godzilla as like, or is it going to be completely two independent properties and, and visions? I, and I, I think they're going to be independent. Okay. You know? And there's nothing and wrong with that though. I, I'm, there I'm, isn't, you know? Absolutely and okay while, with that. You know, uh, uh, you know, in our longer interview, we talk about cinematic universes. Yeah. You know, the question is, do we have a new Godzilla cinematic universe uh, that can grow out of Godzilla minus one? Yeah. So what was your favorite moment of the movie? Whether it was like a, a human moment or just like a, the movie itself was just breathtaking or like what captured you the most? It's funny that, you know, there are so many moments through this that I thought were just brilliant. I think the way it begins is extremely effective. I yeah, love no? the beginning. Like, yeah. I thought it was so good. Because it's not what you expect, right? right. Godzilla movies don't have uh, Godzilla grabbing people by the head and flinging them, you know? Or uh, eating them, like straight up, like what? ripping them apart like a Jurassic yeah. Park movie. It felt like a Jurassic Park movie. Exactly. And I thought that was very liberating to see that at the beginning because that gave the message, this is going to be a different kind of movie than we're used to seeing yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was yeah. not expecting that at all when I sat down and they opened the credits and it was already Godzilla, like yeah. two minutes in maybe. I, I was not expecting it, it at all. It takes so long to get to the monster scenes. Right, you know, right. It was really clever. And people said, you know, oh, there's not much 
you know, there are not many scenes with Godzilla in here. I actually think Godzilla was in the movie quite a bit. They spaced it out very well. Yeah. Uh, so you constantly, you know, had some variety uh, in what you were seeing. So here's some human drama. Here's some military stuff. Here's some Godzilla. Rinse and repeat, you know, uh, yeah. and it goes over and it keeps you moving through the movie quickly. Yeah, I, I would say that was, I really enjoyed the beginning. And then also both the times when Godzilla activated his like blast. Yes. Just uh -huh. like when with the boat, the first time with the boat, I literally audibly said, holy shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then again, I, I didn't say anything when it happened, but I just like when he actually was in Tokyo and used it in yeah. Tokyo, it just was like, wow. Like just the entire, the way they filmed it. And then how, like you said, like there was like silence. Yeah. after it happened mm -hmm. and then just like everyone paused and watched in the anticipation of what was about yeah. to happen it was a tragedy in terms of in the movie's world uh, of what happened but like the way they portrayed it was just masterful fantastic yeah so where do they go from here do you think they're going to continue this cinematic universe or do you think this is all your speculation at this point do you think that they they're going to see the success and say okay we need to continue this storyline, maybe not with the same characters, or maybe use Akiko 20 years later yeah. or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, like, and maybe show Noriko, or maybe she dies from the radiation or whatever the heck that is on her neck. And then Koichi's still there, but then he has to, something happens to him. Who knows? But do you think that they use that or they do, they kind of go the Shin Godzilla and then use a different director every single time to give their own image or their own vision? So I'm always wrong every time I make a prediction about where Godzilla is <laughs> going to go next. So put no faith in any of this. I personally hope that they let Yamazaki come back and do another one, whether it's the next one, whether it's down the road. You know, I do think he has got a vision of mm -hmm. the series and really has started a new creative take on it. So I would be thrilled to see what he did with it. And I love that idea of, you know, tracing Akiko uh, yeah. to a different point. That's clever. Even if they don't, I hope they get another director of similar quality. You know, yeah. what really has set the most latest two Toho movies apart from so many through the 1990s and into the 21st century was having a quality director who had a resume beyond the Godzilla series, you yeah. know, uh, you know, Ano Hideaki, who did Shin Godzilla, right. of course, has a tremendous anime uh, resume, uh, tremendous creativity. Uh, and now Yamazaki, who made a wide variety uh, of previous films. Finding someone like that, uh, mm -hmm. that can bring some new perspectives to the franchise, while still showing respect for Godzilla and what he's always stood for. Let's hope Toho sticks with that. Yeah, I think, I mean, after Shin Godzilla and this, it's really hard to not follow a somewhat, I don't want to say like a pattern, but like what they're doing now is working. And if you yes. just keep doing yeah. what you're doing, whether yep. it's rebooting and just putting it in a different era every single yep. time, like, yep. okay, we're going to have a Heisei Godzilla movie. Yep. I think it would be kind of cool to have like Akiko yeah. as an adult. Yeah. And they're not afraid. I mean, they showed in this movie, you know, granted they weren't big time jumps, but they weren't afraid to do little time jumps here and there. You can start the next movie out just kind of picking up where you left off and then jumping 20 years into the future yeah. five minutes later, like kind of how they did with Odo Island here and yeah. then Koichi getting back home. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I will say, though, for me, the good news is this movie has been so well received critically and so successful at the box office. Godzilla is definitely coming back. Oh, it's got to. Uh, and so, and fingers crossed for the next MonsterVerse picture that it'll be good as well. Uh, because we are just spoiled having both Hollywood and Toho producing Godzilla movies at the same time. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to that movie. I know my son is too, because he, it's so funny. I asked him after the movie, he's like, so what did you think? Did you like it? And he said, yeah, kind of. <laughs> it was somewhat boring sometimes with the people, but it was Godzilla part was great. <laughs> <I'm> like, <"Okay." laughs> but like we talked about in, in the longer interview, that's the approach. Like some people yeah. just relate, like there's aspects of it for everybody. Yep. You have, you know, the kids, they want to see the, the monsters fighting and destroying and, and doing all their monster things. So you got that. But then you have like a deeper storyline for the people who are looking for that kind of like connection to the characters. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what's amazing to me is that a long number of the people who are going to watch this movie really don't know a lot about Japan. Maybe yeah. they've watched anime. Maybe they've read manga uh, in the past. Uh, uh, but, you know. It's not like me, you know, who's, you know, a Japanese historian and you who's lived in Japan and has a lot of background in it. They're just going because it's a good movie that talks to them. Yeah. 
and and, and I feel like it's a good introduction into like because I don't know if here in the U.S. you get a lot of coverage of post-war here, yeah. But like the perspective from a different side, it's always great to open your ears and eyes to something you're not used to hearing or seeing, right? And right. looking at it from different perspectives is really important. I think this does show, like you said, from like the perspective of those trying to go through this recovery and just figure out where the hell do they go from here? Yeah. Like walking yeah. through the rubble of like yeah. what used to be their homes and finding yeah. out that your entire families are dead. Yeah. And all you have is an angry neighbor who's pissed off because you didn't kill yourself. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's kind of serendipitous that he like ended up, you know, just happened to bump into this girl who hands him a baby. And then that changed his life for the better. Cause who knows where he would have gone otherwise. That's right. And they make a family out of nothing, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's and it's amazing. a very yeah. non-traditional family yeah. at that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. overall, fantastic film. Fantastic film. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, do you have anything else you want to say about it? Because I think we covered a lot. I mean, there's more you we, could, obviously. But Oh, we could go on talking about this forever. The one thing for sure is if you're watching this, I'm guessing you've seen it once at least. It's worth another viewing, too, because I got a lot more out of it the second time uh, around. There really is so much happening here. uh, And the director has put so much thought into it throughout that you can get rewarded for investing more time. Awesome. Yeah. And I, in hindsight, I I wish I had watched the original Godzilla before going to see it. I feel like that would have made the experience way better because watching it after is like, oh, yeah, that kind of, I would have picked up on some of those callbacks in yeah. the movie it had uh-huh. I watched it. So if you, well, by the time you're listening, you probably already, again, already seen it, but watch the original Godzilla and then go watch Godzilla minus one again. <laughs> Definitely. I, I would, I, I'm going to, I'm going to try to go see it again after this. So fingers crossed, uh, you know, finding time with two kids, but uh, <laughs> in work <laughs> in the holidays. Uh, anyway, mm-hmm. thank you for, for doing this. This is so much fun and I'm glad we got to talk about it. I was so excited about sitting down with you about our interview that listeners here are going to hear in about a month or two. But I was so excited about that interview. And then I just was like, man, we could really talk about this movie. And I feel like if we don't talk about it, we're missing out on something because a lot of people are really moved and excited about this film and hearing about it and get another outlet for exploring it. I'm sure people would want to hear your opinion on it too, you know, so. (laughs) This was a lot of fun, Doug. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. And that's it for this Godzilla-filled bonus episode. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Crew of Japan podcast. A big thank you to Bill Tsutsui for sticking around for an extra half hour or so to talk Godzilla Minus One with me. What a phenomenal movie. I hope you all got to see it. Well, if you got to this point in the episode, you probably have seen it. And if you haven't, sorry for spoiling it. My bad. But hopefully you all enjoyed our conversation. Make sure you tune back in during Season 5 to take a wider look at the world of Godzilla and how the monster and the franchise have evolved over time. What were your thoughts on Godzilla Minus One? Share with us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, Blue Sky, LinkedIn, Discord, wherever. Just search Crew of Japan Podcast. K-R-E-W-E-O-F-J-A-P-A-N-P-O-D-C-A-S-D. Why did I spell podcast? I'm pretty sure everyone knows how to spell that. While you're there, subscribe, follow, like, retweet, share, repost, uh, whatever else you do on social media. Let us know how you're enjoying the podcast. Or perhaps you prefer to provide your feedback in a more private setting. Send us an email at crewofjapanpodcast at gmail.com. I'll spell it one more time. K-R-E-W-E-O-F-J-A-P-A-N-P-O-D-C-A-S-T at gmail.com. Speaking of feedback, if you're enjoying what you're listening to today and all this Godzilla-filled content and the Godzilla content to come, please feel free to leave us a five-star rating and or review on your favorite podcast streaming app. Every single one of those five-star ratings and reviews helps others who are interested in Japan and this kind of content find the podcast. And I'm 100% sincere and speak for the crew as a whole when I say that any and all support is incredibly appreciated. But that's it for today. Until next time, whether that's in season five or another bonus episode, only one way to find out. See you then. Looking to start your own podcast and don't know what platform to use? Tell me about it. When we started the Crew of Japan podcast, we tried a bunch of the big name recording platforms, but always came back to the one we're still currently using to this day, Zencaster. 
Zencaster is now the all-in-one solution making podcasting easy. In addition to its high audio and video quality for podcast production, Zencaster provides a full suite of production tools to record, produce, and publish studio quality content from the comfort of your home. Just log in through your browser and start recording. It's that simple. For us, we simply send out links to our guests and they join the lobby. But before you know it, it's all done and you have your studio quality audio and up to 4K video right there ready for you right when you finish. The best part is having their multi-layered backups to ensure that your recordings are in the highest quality, regardless of anyone's internet connection stability. With Zencaster's all-in-one podcasting platform, you can create your podcasts in one place and distribute to all the major destinations. It's really that easy. Go to Zencaster.com slash pricing and use our code Crew of Japan, K-R-E-W-E-O-F-J-A-P-A-N, and you'll get 30% off your first month of any Zencaster paid plan. We want you to have the same easy experiences we do for all of our podcasting and content needs. It's your time to share your story.